Hey everyone. Hello. Good morning. Very good morning. Good to see you all. Thanks for joining in, guys. Hope you all are doing well. Hey Paul. Hi Anita. Hey Enoch. Jafina. Hi Leah. Hello. 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 So I hope you all are doing well. Uh, good to see you all as always. Um, I very quickly, can I request uh, either one of you to start us off with a word of prayer, please? Yes, please go ahead, check in. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, I place each and everyone who has joined here into your hands as we study about your church, as we study about everything. Uh, give us your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I bless each and everyone right here. Give us good internet connections and be with us and guide us throughout this class. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thanks, Serpina. Hi, right, guys. Welcome once again. Um, hi, Roslyn. Hi, uh, La Vega. See you. All right. All right. I hope you've uh, been uh, learning a little bit uh, so far of what we've covered uh, in, in this course reg uh, regarding uh, the Church of God, the House of God, uh, regarding the local church. Um, I hope it's been informative and uh, transform it um, right so to do a very quick recap uh, so far we've covered uh, from section one um, six chapters uh, we've discussed um, in detail about the church its spiritual and natural dimensions uh, the purpose uh, its mission message uh, and the methods the government and its structure of the local church the stages and growth and development where we uh, learned about um, you know how the apostles were added uh, the deacons the elders etc what and what makes the local church strong uh, the some of the principles uh, the healthy principles to have a successful local church and then we go into se uh, the second section uh, where we start talking about the blueprint uh, of god's blueprint for the local church because uh we started off this course by saying uh the local church is god's idea it's his blueprint right and a couple of things what we did see was uh, that the local church is the body of christ and lo the local church is the family um of god right and so uh, some of the things that we uh, discussed in the previous class was the family of god as we mentioned we saw that how the house of God is uh, a spiritual house, right? It's a spiritual house that means, uh, in just like any other household, uh, there is a family, um, and so, and like just like any other family, uh, you know, has its own practices. Uh, you have to conduct yourself a certain way, uh, you know, behave a certain way. We we saw that, and some of the good practices and whatnot, and. Uh, and we saw some of the cultures and the practices at APC as an example. Right, that's what we saw. And uh, we, were, we are encouraged to walk in um, brotherly love, to keep the unity and fellowship of the spirit. Right, And we saw that everyone works. Uh, not every, you know, everyone who is part of the local church is, uh, is encouraged to be involved uh, with something, to, to give back. To the local church, etc. Right. Um, so those are the, some of the things that we looked at, and what a Christ-centered community looks like, and uh, and how we can, uh, you know, in the name of community, we could, you know, we can end up talking about the things of the world, all the unnecessary and the unhealthy things um, that is not necessary, uh, but how a Christ-centered community looks like. Right. What what will their discussions be uh, their conversations be it will all be around um, you know god and his word and his ways etc so to speak okay um so yeah that's where we are at and uh, i hope you all are 
are still breathing and all well. But today we look at chapter 10 in the second section and page 69 in your PDFs. Right, we will talk about the pillar of truth. Uh, we'll try and address quite a few things today. A uh, few chap we'll try and cover a few chapters today, uh, but uh, we'll see how that goes. All right, um, so chapter 10 the local church as the pillar of truth. All right, first Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and uh, it says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself. Now, we've seen this scripture multiple times in this course uh, by now, right? First Timothy chapter 3.15 should become like John 3.16 for us, uh, right? Uh, in this course, that's how it, it is. But we've seen a different aspects of uh, this verse. Uh, you know, different words have been accentuated and can be studied, right? Uh, so if I'm delayed, Paul is writing, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself, which we studied in the previous chapter. And then he goes on to say, conduct yourself in the house of God, right? And then it becomes more descriptive about it, which is the church of the living God. And then goes on to say the pillar and the ground of truth. Uh, so that is where we're at, right? Uh, we've seen it as the house of God and how we have to conduct and behave ourselves as a family in the house of God, uh, which is the church of the living God. And then today we will learn about the pillar, that it is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Okay, that's very important. All those words are important, especially the last word, truth. Right? It is the pillar and ground of not something random or it's a pillar and ground of, you know, whatever. It's the pillar and ground of truth. Okay, um, so uh, very quickly, uh, okay, so what is the difference between a fact and a truth? And do I need a knock knock joke to start off with? Knock knock. Yeah. No. What, is, <laughs> what is the difference between a fact and uh, truth? Can I say something? Yes, I go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. To, well, my understanding. Uh, Facts, uh, facts and truth. The difference is um, facts can change, but truth mm -hmm. remains. Truth, whatever yep. is true today is true tomorrow, but certain facts can change depending on one's yeah. perception. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah. Uh, Collins, are you did you raise your hand as well? I also just wanted to say that uh, uh, a fact can be a whole statement, but the truth can be half or a complete statement still. For instance, if I say that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that one is a fact, but it's also the truth. But again, it's not the whole truth <laughs> because it is he died on the cross, it is correct, but again, he died at Golgoth, oh, he died this time, 29 AD. There are so many things that I can add on, but uh, mm -hmm. the truth can be half the fact. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, yeah, thanks, Collins. Uh, hey, guys, give me a second. There's some interference with my internet connection. Um, just give me a second. Let me just look into that, guys. Sorry. Sorry, guys, I had to change my connection. Um, thankfully, there are two internet connections at home. <laughs> uh, right. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Uh, but yeah, 
so facts can change as in can be one thing today but the truth uh, remains and then we see uh bible says that he is jesus is the way the truth and the life right the fact is that the woman suffered with the issue of blood for 12 years the truth is jesus is a healer and he heals right so uh and and that's why it's, the emphasis is there on that last word that we, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth Okay. And so uh, in the notes, it goes on to say the local church is to be the pillar and ground of truth, the upholder, the standard bearer, the foundation of truth in a sin, sick, corrupt, dark, and depraved world. Right? Uh, we are almost called to be like a lighthouse that is shining the light and showing the truth, showing the way, the leading the way kind of thing. Okay, uh, We are the upholder and the standard bearer. Right. Um, so when people want to know what is right and wrong, they should look at the local church in their community as a reference point. But um, so the question again uh, to us is, uh, can people do that these days? Right? Uh, are, are people able to look at the church to know what is right and wrong? What do you think? I can wait all fifteen minutes. I, I, I think uh, people. Sh I think people should look at, uh, look up to the church for truth because the church is upholding the 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 word of God, which is uh, the foundation, the Bible. So I think people should, though sometimes some choose not to, but I think people should choose to look to the church. To for truth. Yeah. Uh, people should look to the church. Yeah, that's a different thing. Uh, yeah, and I agree with you that people should look to the church and whatnot. But uh, my question to us is: uh, uh, Can people look to the church uh, these days and uh, for that to know what is right and wrong? Um, can they? Can they still do that? Yes. Go ahead. I do think that people. Uh, can look, it's true that they can look at the church, but the church will not always give us the real truth. Uh, I think the whole truth, people should always get it from, from the Bible, <laughs> because there are some churches mm -hmm. which are funny, but um, because you and yeah. I, I mean, all of us are here to study about the local church and yeah. give the, the real blueprint of God's church, we should be able to have churches that are yeah. preaching the real things in the Bible preaching the real gospel as it is written in the Bible. That's my contribution, Pastor. Yeah, hey, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, there's, uh, I guess, a typo. <laughs> For, oh, uh, all right. It depends upon which church we're talking about. Okay, no, I mean, it doesn't matter. We're talking about general, like, you know, the general, the overall body of Christ all over the world. Okay, um, so the point here, the reason that I ask is some of the most of the times we can get question posed to us as Christians saying, um, uh, "What do you think about say? What do you think about same-sex marriage, for example?" That is how a question will be framed uh, most of the times, right? Uh, but then the point is. What they are seeking is for our opinion in the form of an answer. And, uh, you know, that's what it is, isn't it? And most of the time, and I've seen uh, good people who respond to questions like that, is it doesn't matter what I think, but what I believe is the truth, and that's the word of Christ, uh, word of God, right? So, um, And so when people want to know what is right and wrong, what they are really looking for and what, you sh what we should know is... Uh, our opinions is not the, is not what is important. What God's word says is what is important, right? Uh, because moving into the next section, you see in John chapter 17, verse 17, it says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, right? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Right um, now, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this about Psalm 119 uh, in, in 
in the last semester or not but uh, please forgive me if i'm uh, if i'm uh, redundant about it but uh, psalm 119 uh, you know it's it's said to be a love poetry for the word of god it's love poetry for the word of god right so there are about 170 176 verses I think in Psalm 119 and uh, depending on the I mean the version of your Bible uh, you will uh, mine is NIV and these are the words that are repeated in every single verse of that Psalm in Psalm 119 you will you will find the words uh, word ways statues laws precepts decrees commands promise and all of these words are equi uh, are pointing to God's word, right? All of this. So uh, Psalm 119, 175 verses, almost every verse has these words repeated. And that's saying something about the word of God, right? I mean, time and time again, uh, some of the popular verses uh, Psalm 119 verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119 verse 9, I think, how can a young man uh, you know, make his ways pure by living according to the word of God? Uh, Psalm 119 verse 18 says, open my eyes to the hidden things of your word uh, that I may know your ways or your decrees and precepts, right? Um, same way, I mean, if you just read that psalm, verse after verse after verse, the emphasis uh, of on on the on the word of God is brought up so beautifully. And so, if you haven't read that verse uh, psalm, don't be scared that it has so many verses. But then, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful um, psalm, and I would encourage you to do that. So, uh, the Church of God. Uh, as a as a pillar uh, of and the ground of truth, uh, we need to be aligned and committed to the truth. We need to be aligned and committed to the truth, right? Uh, so the local church is the upholder and the foundation of truth, right? Um, we have this. Uh, um, we. Oh, I'm not. We, tradition not tradition but this practice at APC is that we make a declaration every Sunday at church service uh, you know where we, you know we emphasize on the importance of declaring the Word of God and, and right so uh, what we do is we lift up our Bibles high up in the air we say this is God's Word this is God speaking to me I am who God says I am I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing. You know, I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. And we concluded by saying Christ is my master, and to him I am in absolute surrender. Right, and the importance once again is on the word of God, which is uh, the truth, and it's the truth that sanctifies us. Right, and it is so important once again for the local church to be aligned and committed to the word of God. Right, uh, no dilution, nothing else, just the word of God. Right, the importance of uh, reading the word and the importance of studying the word. There are two very different things. Reading the word, studying the word are not the same. Uh, this uh, quick suggestion, um, side note, if you want to, you can uh, just check out this book called uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee. Um, the book like that, you can, um, see if you can get your hands on it. Um, it's a lovely book, just to how to read the Bible, but then the more content on how to study the Bible. Um, so it's very important for us as leaders, uh, you know, of the local church being committed to God's word because if we as leaders compromised, right, then it's going to be difficult for the rest of the local church, the body, uh, to uphold the truth. Once again, it starts with the leaders, right? The, the water always flows down. Right? It has to come down. So everything flows from top. So if the top, if the leadership uh, is compromised, um, then the whole of the congregation um, will, will, will be hard for them to... Uh, 
to uphold the truth because uh, remember that word compromise is something that kills our spirit it it, it will absolutely destroy uh, your christian uh, walk uh, in uh, everyday walk uh, walk uh, you know and I, I like this uh, i don't know hindi a lot but then I, there's this one hindi word which is used for compromises um, uh, what my friends say is the chalta hai chalta hai attitude like you know hey uh, yeah it's okay you know it's okay attitude uh, it's okay it's just this thing it's okay it's okay you know it's just it's just one shot or it's just uh, you know one drag or something like that you know all of that is compromise right and it's compromise that is um, absolutely dangerous uh, for us as uh, <laughs> that attitude will kill our spirit right so uh, we as leaders we have to be mindful of that right and and studying the word reading the word uh, and when asked to speak on current issues uh, we should boldly and unashamedly declare what god's word has to say about these topics uh, right uh, what god's word has to say about these topics right once again so it's not your opinion it's what god's word has to say about uh, certain topics that uh, you know that the popular culture has questions about the society has questions about because um and time and time again we see in the bible that uh, the word of god is like this the word of god is like that there are symbols that it's compared to right um if, for example in hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 we see that um the word of god is compared to a double the double-edged sword it's uh hebrews uh I think chapter 4 verse 12 and also Ephesians 4 12 I think it says uh, his word uh, is like the sword the double-edged sword the Hebrew says the double-edged sword in uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 29 we see that his word is, uh, is again drawing a symbol to fire that refines us or a hammer that breaks and convicts us right and 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 I just mentioned Psalm 119, verse 105, which uh, his word is a like a light and a lamp unto our feet. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, we see that his word is like food. It also Peter writes about it in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2. And it's like seed. Uh, James writes saying that his word is like a mirror, like, you know, where you see and you, you know, you, and you, it, it draws us into correcting ourselves, into changing ourselves. And then he goes on to say, you know, if a man just looks himself into the mirror and walks away without making any changes or correction, what's the point of looking into a mirror? Like when you look into a mirror to see, okay, is there anything or how you look? So James is saying that that's what God's word is like, right? And Ephesians uh, 5.23 says it's like water that cleanses us. Right, and there are so many things, uh, you know, like that. Uh, Psalm 19 verse 10. It's like uh, his words, like a honey, like uh, to our lips. Right. So again, <laughs> these are all symbols, and and if we just took time to just study and meditate on all of these things and let God's word do what it does best uh, in us, um, we would be the church uh, that that you know the Bible is talking about, uh, the the foundation and the pillar of truth. Right, because um, remember, we are talking about the blueprint. The church is God's blueprint. Right? There's the blueprint, and once you start constructing anything, we un we we all know the importance of foundation. Um, right? We all know the importance of and the and the consequences and the danger of a weak foundation. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody in this world understands the importance of foundation. But the question is, uh, how strong is the foundation? How deep is the foundation? Uh, that's the other thing, right? We all know the story about this, uh, the foolish man and the wise man who builds the house. One builds the house upon the rock and the other builds the house upon the sand, right? Um, the Sunday school song, the rains came down and the floods went up. Uh, <laughs> right? The one very interesting thing is that the wise man dug deep uh, until he hit the rock, one translation says. I mean, it's 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 from there we get this phrase called rock bottom, or I hit rock bottom. It's not from WWE. <laughs> okay, the Dwayne the Rock Johnson's rock bottom. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, it's not rock bottom when you hit from when you fall from top and hit a rock. No, you dig so deep 
until you hit a rock that is what actually the rock bottom is like you know we and once again we all know that you know jesus is the rock and the psalmist says in times of trouble lead me to the rock that is higher than i right and so our foundation's got to go deep uh, solid in in him him he is the truth once again right um and then in john 1 we see that he is the word and so the emphasis of us uh, building this re this uh, relationship, studying and reading God's word, um, is unparalleled. It's, it, to say it's important is an understatement, right? Um, so, what do we do now? Now that we understand the importance of it, what do we do? How can we go about this thing? The next point is raise up people who will be, who will be upholders of the truth. Right? So before we come to this point, guys, remember, before we build our congregation, before we build people to be upholders of truth, the importance uh, of leaders not being compromised, leaders being deeply rooted in the word of God is crucial. Right? Once that is said, then we move, move to raising up people who will be upholders of the truth right um we, we see the prayer that jesus makes in john chapter 17 it's uh one of those um classic chapters in the bible john chapter 17 um right it says as the lord jesus prayed for his disciples and those of us who believed on him while acknowledging that we are not of the world and yet we are being sent into the world right and jesus prays sanctify them by your truth for your word is truth okay so the first thing is when we are raising up people they need to be sanctified by the truth that is the word of god not your truth not your opinions not what you think uh not your suggestions or advice whatnot they need to be sanctified by the truth which is the word of god we just saw uh, every symbol that the Bible talks about that the Word of God is like the refining fire. Let it refine them, right? Let it wash them, let it cleanse them, let it break them like the hammer, let it pierce their heart like a double-edged sword, right? All of that process is a, sanctif a sanctification process, right? Um, so first, they need to be sanctified by the truth. And as pastors or ministry leaders, uh, we must preach, teach, and proclaim the undiluted uncompromised clear and complete word of god okay undiluted uncompromised a complete word of god not once a year not twice a year not, not only on easter or good friday or new year's eve but week after week continually right so the word of god will sanctify people and empower them to go into the world and yet not be part of it. Okay, uh, can I say that again? The word of God will equip them, will sanctify them, uh, will empower them to go into the world and yet not be part of it. Uh, right, so that is very important and that is how we raise people, um, you know, to, to be, now, who will be up, uh, the upholders of the truth, uh, so to say? Right. And as pastors, we must, and ministry leaders, we must make sure that our preaching and teaching inspires, empowers, and equips equip God's people to uphold the truth in the world. In one of the earlier chapters, I'm not sure if you remember, uh, we spoke very briefly about the importance of preaching the word of God from the pulpit, the pulpit ministry right uh it's a place where god's given to minister to people and we cannot take it lightly we cannot take that opportunity or that privilege uh, so lightly we have to look at it as an opportunity to touch people's lives and to release the word of god that will change them forever right so that's the importance of it so uh, raising up people who will be upholders of truth uh, let the word of god do its work and next we see that beware of compromise right beware of compromise um john 17 16 says they are not of the world 
just as I am not of the world. Right? Um, and once again, uh, you know, I mentioned I, I, one of the things that God tells the people of Israel uh, when he brings them out of Egypt is uh, be careful uh, not to partake or, you know, uh, to be conformed to the ways of the uh, the Canaanites. Uh, don't bow down to the gods that they worship. Uh, you know, uh, don't be conformed to the culture, to their ways or their sinful ways. What do they do? Exactly what God told them not to do. Right? Um, and God was very clear. When you read the book of Judges, at least from the from chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, we see that when God told them to drive out every nation of that land in the, can in the land of Canaan, they did not follow that command 100%. They let a couple of tribes to just be in their land. So the same people that they allowed to be in their lands, which God told them to drive out, later began to oppress them. Okay, um, now this things like compromise again. It's um, the reason I want to dwell on this for another minute is it's not just the congregation or the other uh, people that that compromise or that kind of struggle with this. As pastors, as ministry leaders, uh, the challenges are real for us as well. Right, for us to just have our eyes fixed on Jesus and not to compromise with the things of the world so that our spirits are not killed is very crucial and uh, he goes on to say in Matthew 5 verse 13 right you are the salt of the earth and if the salt loses its flavor how shall it be seasoned if the salt is compromised it's a very military word isn't it uh, this facility has been compromised uh, you know we've been compromised that means there's been an invasion uh, you know, this computer is compromised. That means a virus uh, is, you know, has been, uh, a hacker has hacked a uh, uh, system and whatnot. So that this, so if we are compromised, that means something of the world is now in. And so that is how we lose our influence. That is how salt loses its saltiness. Like you are the salt of the earth, Jesus is saying, right? But if salt loses its flavor. How shall it be seized? If we lose, if we compromise, if we lose our influence, uh, what's going to happen to us? Right? So um, the note says, as pastors and leaders, we will face pressures to be soft, nice, and not be too force and not too forceful in stating the truths uh, of God's word, especially when it comes to areas where people do not want us to rock the boat or stir the pot, so to speak. We must be aware of compromise. We are not of this world and we cannot give up the truth to adjust with this world. Okay, that's a very important line there. We are not of this world and we cannot give up on the truth to adjust with this world. We cannot change the truth or the word of God just because some people in the congregation might get offended of that or the world. Oh, this is what this says. I'm offended by it. Well, it's, it's truth. There's nothing I can do about it. That's what God says. Uh, that's what His Word says. That's what I'm saying. I stand by it. It's what it is. It's one of it's like one of those mafia movies that says it is what it is. Right? They say, um, "Beware of compromise, guys." Um, it's crucial. And uh, Provide biblical response to current issues. First um, Corinthians fourteen eight says, "For if the trumpet makes a certain uh, makes an uncertain sound, uh, who will prepare for battle?" Right? People want to know what God's word has to say about critical issues they face today. Okay, uh, people are searching for the truth. Um, most of the time, they know that. Some of them don't know that they are searching for the truth, but it's what it is. The point is that they are searching and 
we must apply God's truth to today's problem. We must provide answers from God's word for today's challenges because his word uh, will always be relevant. Um, the question, the classic question that is out there today is, is God's word still relevant today? Is, is the Bible still relevant uh, in this day and age? Uh, that is the question if, uh, you know, I surprise you or not, but then it definitely is, isn't it? And it all comes down to us as leaders. Uh, if we can, if we, if we can uh, you know, train ourselves, teach ourselves to give, provide biblical responses to current issues, right? Um, just so some of the practical ways a local church can implement this um, is coming down to uh, page 71 in the notes, is ensure that the preaching and teaching from the pulpit is sound, strong, and uncompromising. Address real life issues or problems and challenges with the word of God. Speak the truth in love. Uh, empower and encourage believers to live by the truth out there in the world where it really matters. Uh, encourage believers to engage society in meaningful ways to present God's truth in the world and encourage believers to take up opportunities to bring kingdom values and kingdom perspectives into the public places and forums. Um, right, uh, encouraging people. Uh, that I think the last point is, is crucial, which kind of uh, resonates for the rest of the points. Is uh, you know, often, most very often, we use these words uh, full time. I'm in mean, full time ministry. Uh, it simply means that you can touch the world and impact and influence the world around you only if you're a full time in ministry, like full time pastor, full time evangelist, full time apostle, uh, missionary, whatnot. But then uh wherever god has placed you now uh, you are the salt of the earth and you are called and commissioned uh, to impact and influence the world around you uh, wherever it is whatever the office that god has placed you in college schools uh, government offices uh, whatever it is we are commissioned to bring kingdom values and kingdom perspective into public places and forums right classic examples are joseph uh, from the bible and daniel uh, from the bible right so they were all placed in political places that was their position and how they brought in kingdom values and kingdom perspectives into the places where they were part of um, is so many things that we can learn of and that's what we are encouraged um, to do and some of the challenges uh, for us as leaders to be prepared for is uh, complex issues may arise that will require some serious study. Okay, you see those words, <laughs> serious study of God's word and hearing from heaven to accurately communicate God's word. Okay, uh, example, corruption, homosexuality, various scenarios of divorce, uh, euthanasia, abortion, universal salvation, and so on. I mean, the list can go on. Uh, these are just some of the examples, right? So, uh, and some of the popular, I mean, I'm just coming out of leading uh, youth ministry and the classic question is uh, uh, from not all of them, from most of them, if not some of them is, um, uh, you know, why should I believe in a God? Does God exist? Uh, the, um, you know, how can I believe in the credibility of the word of God? Or the authenticity of the word of God. How do I know that the Bible is the word of God? Uh, and that's just one question. The challenges, the challenging questions that you can be prepared for, right? That's a very apologetic uh, kind of question. Is the apologetic kind of question, and questions on homosexuality and whatnot. So, as leaders, we take time to just okay, you know, understand. These are some of the tough, challenging questions. That the people around us are actually asking and so uh, as a pastor as a ministry leader uh, it is it comes down to our uh, uh, our responsibility to make time to study about it from god's word and how we can respond to it right there's material and content also available online but then we coming back to god's word is what is crucial right um so those are some of the um, some of the challenges uh, you know that we can be prepared for, and again, it's just three points there. But then it's not exhaustive. Challenges can come in all different ways and forms and shapes. 
Okay, um, so that's where we're at in this chapter as the local church, which is the pillar of truth, right? Um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts that you want to share? Okay, I, I think uh, everybody's cool. Um, great, so we move on to the next chapter on page 72, chapter 11, the local church as an army. Uh, I, this I think by far is uh, one of my favorite chapters. Uh, uh, I like all the other facets of uh, the local church as the, we are the family of God, uh, you know, we, uh, we are the pillar of foundation of truth, but we are an army. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? And just a chapter ago, we studied about the local church as the family of God. It's so nice. We are all one. We are the family. And then all of a sudden, we are an army. And it's like, you know, ooh. Um, but, but hey, it's what it is. It's what God's word, uh, again, you know, resonates and says. Um, right? So we're often, uh, there is this analogy or, or the parallel or the symbol that's used quite often. and at the very beginning we we saw from matthew chapter 16 uh verse 15 to 19 right it says uh you know the gates of hell shall not prevail and the church will advance and the gates of hell shall not prevail uh against us right so um there is a a military uh you know kind of a thing assigned there to the local church as an army we are commanded and we learned when we started that the gates don't move. The gates don't come forward or go back, go to the left or go to the right. You know, it's it's a stationary. Uh, but it's the army that advances to the gate. And so as the church of God, right, uh, we are commanded to advance to the gates. And Jesus has said, the gates of hell will not prevail. That means the church the local church is bestowed with is bestowed with power and influence and we are commanded to advance the gates of hell right so there in itself the foundation is you know the tone is kind of set as an army of god right and also apostle paul time and time again uh, he uses a lot of military imagery uh, in his uh, epistles in his writings uh, depicting believers engaged in spiritual conflict Right, uh, Ephesians chapter six is just an example of it, but we will go through that in a little later. Um, let's look at a few scriptures mentioned in the notes there, shall we? It says Philippians chapter two verse twenty-five. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Ephroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, uh, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need fellow worker, fellow soldier, right? Um, you can highlight it if you want to. First Timothy 1.18 says, the charge I commit, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Right? And one first Timothy chapter six, verse 12, fight, the good fight of faith. You to fight, right? Um, Second Timothy chapter two, verse three and four. You therefore must end your hardship as a good soldier, enduring hardships or challenges as a good soldier. Um, a soldier in the battlefield, it's not a walk in the park, isn't it? It's like, okay, come on, let's go and take over that field. That territory is ours. Everything is beautiful. Right, um, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of hurdles, uh, and a lot of things are involved and that goes into being a soldier, right? And so you see Paul again writing there saying, Endure the hardships as a good soldier. Verse 4, it goes on to say, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, remember, guys, uh, you know, neither Paul 
North Timothy are involved or engaged in what is known as the guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare is the ones that you fight, uh, you know, on the ground, like the Second World War, all of that has happened. So, um, but they're using the language, the imagery uh, of, of an army, of a soldier. And finally, we see in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it says, I have fought the good fight. I have uh, finished the race. I have kept the faith. Right, and so immediately, uh, and there's so much, so many more references um, to us um, at the local church as the army of God. We are, you know, we are born into the warfare, kind of, so to speak. Right, and John chapter ten, verse ten, it says, "A thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy." Right. I hope we all know that. Right. So there is a very real enemy. Uh, out there, uh, you know, our enemy, um, he he absolutely hates us to his very core. He just doesn't, it's uh, John 10, 10 says, right, that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That means he's just not coming to just steal what you have, but he's coming to kill you. He's just not coming to kill you, but he's coming to destroy you. That means he hates you so much that he wants to make it look like you never e even existed. And uh, that our enemy is very real, right? He absolutely hates you from his very bottom of the core, so to say, right? Um, and our enemy is real. And so, like it or not, we are born into this warfare and um, but god is with us we are his sons and daughters right and we are we are in his army right uh, and then we see god's word encouraging us uh, time and time again again from ephesians 6 right asking us to you know wear on the armor of god and you know all those language and terminologies um right so we go to this next section where we say a sense of spiritual militancy is important so we are in the middle of spiritual conflict <laughs> okay uh if, if if you've been just been uh you know if you were not aware of that well please wake up you're in the middle of a battle um you know <laughs> you know we are in the middle of spiritual conflict we are to be taught and trained on how to engage in spiritual battle we have to be taught and i think most of the times we kind of shy away from this topic of spiritual warfare oh no that's too pentecostal right now for me you know i i am i'm a very soft spoken person i like you know i don't like speaking loud and you know i'm very kind and generous and whatnot but then and so we shy away from the topics like that uh, as being taught on the and on the importance of how to engage in spiritual warfare is a very important topic that needs to be taught in church right a sense of spiritual militancy at a personal level uh, believers need to know how to resist the devil and his schemes to overcome temptations and how to not give the devil access into their lives right we must know how to use the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the devil throws at us right first peter uh, 5 8 and 9 he says be sober and vigilant what does that mean uh, in the battle right be sober be vigilant that means be in a be at high alert at all times and be in the right frame of mind you don't be drunk in the middle of the battle uh, because being drunk in alcohol or in wine is going to influence you so the, you know the, al the alcohol is going to have influence over you that means you are not going to be in the right state of mind. You are not going to be on high alert because there is this enemy that is lurking around. All right, Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, like destroy once again. Right, um, and um, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we see, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness 
in um, heavenly places. Second Corinthians 2 11 it says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Right? If we are ignorant, if we are not on high alert, uh, if we are not vigilant, if we are not sober, uh, you've you've not just given the devil a loophole, but you've just opened the door. It's like, hey, you know, please welcome. Have your way in my life, devil. I welcome thee, you know, and I'm giving you this gift in a golden platter. Have thine way, types, you know. Um, and so it, it's <laughs> it's important for us to be vigilant and uh, and and sober and be alert at all times, because um, as as again as spiritual leaders, um, pastors, ministry leaders, whatnot, it's. Um, but the danger is more for us as well. So the enemy may even attempt to strike down people in position at leadership. And that's what Zech Zechariah chapter 13, uh, verse 7 talks about, right? Uh, he is, you know, he's looking to strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So if the shepherd is striked, the flock is gone, right? Um, so that's both on the in, on the individual level and also as a collective as a congregation right for example as a, as a collective as a church as a body of christ uh we've been given a mission isn't it a mission is to go out and win souls and make disciples right and that involves spiritual warfare battle for souls is a spiritual battle Okay, if you didn't know it already, now you do. Okay, um, all right, I just realized that we've gone over time. Um, so we'll pause here and uh, we'll take a break and uh, we'll get back to the lesson. All right, guys, see you in 10.